Good morning. This is Sunday, January 3rd, 2021. First Sunday in the year. Uh, we're going to be picking up where we left off some time back uh, in the commandments of the New Testament. We stopped kind of in the middle of don't revile those who revile you. So this is B. This is part B. This is the uh, uh, <clears throat> the part that has to do with our faith. What happens when uh, they revile us for our faith. Um, there's uh, surprisingly some difference of opinion uh, regarding uh, defense of the faith uh, in the Christian community, um, probably because of the way that we presented certain other passages of Scripture, uh, which don't necessarily uh, lean toward the uh, the truth of what the uh, uh, the Bible was actually saying at that point, but let's let's uh, jump into this, and we'll get to that in a moment. <clears throat> Don't uh, revile those who revile you. Part B. Um, last time uh, in this uh, duty to mankind section, uh, we uh, talked about. Uh, uh, loving your neighbor as yourself, and uh, don't revile those who revile you. This time, as a subtopic, we're going to be talking uh, about reviling, uh, being reviled for your faith, and how we're to react, how we're to uh, deal with that um, uh, when people challenge us or uh, question us or even attack us for our, our stupid beliefs. Um, how are we supposed to react? And uh, uh, what does the Bible say? What does God say about how we are to react? Uh, there are a lot of folks out there that believe that, uh, you know, we have to defend God. We have to defend our faith. Uh, we've been, uh, we've been uh, uh, given the idea that the armor of God is given to us specifically for that purpose. And uh, you can Google images of the armor of God and, and each one of them with very, very few exceptions, are uh, very aggressive in their stance, uh, bearing the, the armor of God. We're not just attacking um, uh, Satan and uh, his wiles, his deceptions, but uh, we're attacking those who attack the faith. And, and uh, in defense of the faith, we are uh, sword drawn and, and ready to do battle, onward Christian soldiers and, and all of that. Um, you should probably know that although we are are called to be uh, uh, wearing the armor of God, we're we're not to be wearing it for offense, but for defense. And uh, the only part of this uh, that is the uh, the offensive part is the sword, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. In other words, we're to defend God, defend our faith, defend what we believe. Uh, with the the word of truth, the spirit of truth, which is the word of God, the Bible, not our own feelings, not our preachings, not what we've heard from the pulpit, not what we have heard on a tape series or a, uh, or a, a video or some such thing, but with the word of God. Uh, we need to be prepared, yes, but um, uh, we need to be prepared with God rather than uh, with with man, and uh, that is kind of the distinction that's made in Scripture here. So let's jump in. Let's turn to First Peter four fourteen through sixteen. First Peter four fourteen to sixteen. Now I'm going to be moving right along in these passages. So if you're listening to this study or watching it on YouTube. Uh, what you might want to do is stop the the uh, recording uh, when we uh, uh, when we get to a, a verse like this. Look it up and uh, put your finger there and then <laughs> continue with the uh, with the video. First Peter four fourteen. Now let's skip back to verse twelve just to pick up the context here. First uh, Peter four twelve. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, uh, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that, while, or that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Uh, the, the point being made here is that we're not supposed to accept 
tragedy and evil and difficulties in our lives as coming from anywhere but God himself. These things are happening to us um, because they are caused, not because there's bad luck in the world or happenstance or, or uh, um, uh, the fates or, or whatever. We as Christians are not to believe in these things. The Bible says they are myths. Indeed, if you think about it long enough, you have to understand that, that these myths, that is, let's just take luck as the general heading for them. Luck has been invented by unbelievers to explain those things that happen that are otherwise referred to, or in the past at least, as acts of God. Uh, I'm not just talking about the whirlwinds and the storms and the, the uh, 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 tornadoes and things like that. <clears throat> Indeed, those two are the acts of God. Uh, but, uh, but the things like adversity and difficulty in your life and tribulation, uh, these things are brought upon us by God for a wide variety of purposes. Uh, but that's a different sermon. Let's, um, let's get back to, to this one. Verse 14, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Now, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't stop and you don't think, oh, no, I can't believe that I'm, I'm being revived. No, you're supposed to be happy. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. But, and here's the, the, here's the warning, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or as a, an evildoer, or as a busybody, a gossip, a, in, in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. We're, what, what he's communicating here is that we're not to, we're not to take pride in the fact that people are reviling us for for being jerks, we're we're uh, if we do something that hurts someone else, and uh, people revile us for that, just because we're a Christian, don't take any any pleasure in that. Uh, don't don't uh, believe that we are immune from these things, and we can take happiness in God as a result of these things. Uh, if you if you're a jerk, uh, suffer as a jerk. But if you are suffering for the name and sake of Christ and the faith, then you, you should be not ashamed, but glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of it be? Of them that obey not the gospel of God. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, uh, you know, uh, not to not to uh, repeat myself too frequently, but uh, but somebody came to Jesus uh, during his ministry. And one of the disciples asked Jesus, "You know, are there going to be many saved or few saved?" And Jesus replied, "No, there are going to be very few saved. Many people will try to get into the kingdom of heaven, and will not be able to." Uh, just because you desire heaven doesn't mean you're going. Um, there's, uh, there are commandments to deal with. And if you uh, refuse these commandments, if you ignore these commandments, uh, then uh, you are ignoring the Lord. That's what the word Lord means. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them suffer according to the will of God, that, that suffer according to the will of God, commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. If Jesus is our Lord and Savior, that means that we're supposed to be obeying him. That's what the word Lord is intended to communicate. He is Lord and we are not. There are too many people who believe that uh, uh, the prayer should be um, uh, our our genie, which art in heaven. And uh, uh, God takes offense at these kinds of things. He has all the way through scripture, Old and New Testament alike. 
Let's turn to the next one, which is uh, Matthew 5. Matthew 5, verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Righteousness is a much misunderstood word in Christianity today in contemporary church. Um, the uh, uh, righteous means uh, for way too many people, it means doing good. Uh, you're, you're being a good person. Uh, no, righteousness more specifically refers to the commandments that God has given to us in both the Old Testament to the Jews and to the New Testament unto the church. Righteousness is obeying God, not just doing good the way you think good should be done or the, the way that men around you, your peers, consider to be good. Uh, you are to be doing good according to what God considers good and, of course, evil as well. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 10, 22. Chapter 10, 22. And I'll read uh, uh, from 22. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Uh, this is a, a common uh passage uh, in scripture that we are to endure in the faith. Uh, but unfortunately, endure doesn't mean quite the same thing to a lot of contemporary Christians as it does in plain English, especially that uh, that was translated when our Bibles uh, were translated from the original languages. Endure to the end means that you are to not just protect yourself from all of the, the slings and arrows. No, you are to stay in the faith. You are, endure means to stay regardless of what happens to you or to uh, the things around you. Uh, you are to endure. You are to stay. You are to be what scripture refers to as being steadfast. You are to be steadfast in the faith, enduring in the faith, until the end of your natural life, or the rapture, whichever comes first. So enduring is an important part of salvation. Uh, if you leave the faith, regardless of your reason, you were a Christian, you had the Holy Spirit, you, uh, uh, you did all the right things, you looked forward to uh, eternity in heaven, and then you decided on a whim to leave the faith, there is no more salvation possible for you, according to Scripture. But that, again, is a, another sermon. Let's continue here. Uh, Luke 6, 22 to 23. Luke 6, 22 to 23. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did the fathers unto the prophets. The fathers referring, uh, Jesus is referring to here, are the, the Jewish fathers, the prophets uh, <coughs> in the Old Testament. Um, the, the Jews did horrible things to their prophets. Uh, uh, and I won't go into details here. I, I don't want to take the time. But um, if you're interested, you can look through Scripture or, or any good uh, uh um, encyclopedia or commentary on on uh, the Old Testament prophets. It's uh, uh, 
it's horrible what the Jewish people did to the prophets that God sent to them. And uh, I mean, uh, they were they were murdered. They were uh, stoned. Uh, one was even sawn in half with a wooden saw. It was a it's a they're horrible things that they did in order to escape the word of God coming from the prophets. We are uh, not to be of like mind, even if we aren't in like action. God will judge the hearts of men, not just the hands of men. So whether you do something with your wickedness, your wicked heart, what you what you think about, what you dwell on, uh, God is going to judge that regardless of whether you put it into physical action, um, you will be judged for your heart rather than for just your hands. Acts 5.41, Acts 5.41. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Now, there's a, an awful lot of jumping for joy and rejoicing that are commanded of those people who suffer for the name of Jesus. We are not uh, to go south on this kind of persecution or reviling we are commanded to rejoice and in no uncertain terms. Uh, the idea of rejoicing, though, can be taken too far, and we've got to be very careful, as First uh, Peter cautioned us, not to be, <clears throat> not to take pride or rejoice in being in being a jerk about Jesus either. Uh, we have to be relatively comfortable that we're 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 saying the right things uh, and doing the right things and that's the reason that we are continuously pointed to the word of god not to our own feelings and not not to our own view of god and our own world view but to scripture and scripture alone uh, the uh, uh, kingdom hall and uh, the jehovah's witnesses uh, and uh, mormons are Take these verses to heart, and uh, when they appear at your door and, and uh, uh, they get an angry look from you and uh, you close the door in their face, you're not interested in that, all the way down the sidewalk uh, uh, from your house, they are rejoicing in the Lord because they've suffered persecution for the name of Jesus. And, and uh, this, unfortunately, although it's unfounded, is difficult to imagine uh, because we don't do these same things. So when somebody does uh, denounce you or, or criticize you or call you stupid for believing in this silliness, um, don't uh, <laughs> make sure that what, what they are reacting to is, is the word of God and not your take on the word of God and not not some idea that you've heard from the pulpit, but from the word of God alone. Uh, if you quote scripture and uh, uh, it's very plain to them what it is that scripture is saying about what they are doing or what, what should be done in a situation. Uh, if they revile you for that, reviling you for quoting scripture, reviling you for revealing the word of God to them in this situation. If you are reviled for that, then you can rejoice. Uh, but if, if you've um, got a controversial view of scripture or one that is proprietary, something that you've thought up on your own, or you've heard from the pulpit or from some tape series uh, that you haven't investigated yourself, then you're standing on the shoulders of giants, quote unquote, Nevertheless, you haven't looked into it for yourself, and you are outside of Scripture at this point. You're leaning on the, the weight of other men, and God says that the heart of man is desperately wicked, and he makes no distinction between the Christian and the non-Christian here. 
We are, uh, we are to rely exclusively on the word of God and not on what we hear from this or any other video or, or tape or, or a commentary on what God has said in scripture. 2 Corinthians 2, 15. 2 Corinthians 2, 15. <clears throat> For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. Now, in both the saved and the unsaved, we are a sweet smelling savor. Uh, we are an aroma. Uh, they used to say these same kinds of words about the barbecue at the altar of God in the Old Testament. Um, the, the sacrifice of animals on the altar uh, was a sweet-smelling savor to God, as was the incense that was burned on the incense altar. In all of these cases, uh, these are sweet-smelling savors, in this case, of Christ, in them that are saved, as well as to them that perish. To the one, we are the savor of death unto death and to the other, a savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Listen to what he's saying here. But as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Coram Dio means to, is Latin for living your life in the presence of God. And we, we have to never forget that even when we're speaking to the unbeliever, we're speaking of God in the presence of God. And if we say something stupid in the presence of God, then we will be held accountable for it. Now, we can be forgiven if we repent but it's not an automatic kind of a thing. Just because you've accepted Jesus into your heart doesn't mean that you are automatically forgiven of all sins that you will commit in the years to come. That's why Jesus said specifically in the Lord's Prayer, what we like to refer to as the Lord's Prayer, uh, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Every prayer that we pray should include a request for forgiveness. The disciples came to Jesus and said, teach us how to pray. And Jesus responded by, by saying, this is the way you pray. When you pray, say this. Now, I don't think that you have to say precisely the same words because <laughs> Jesus was speaking Greek at the time. Uh, so don't, don't try to to memorize the Lord's Prayer and pray this every time. The ideas, though, and the concepts that are contained in the Lord's Prayer are things that should be inclusive in each prayer that we pray. A prayer is yet another uh, uh, difficult con concept in the contemporary Christian church because so much about prayer has been said and corrupted by the wicked hearts of men. We, we've gotten it into our head, all kinds of weird things about prayer. God is extremely specific all the way through Scripture about how we are to pray. And Jesus is specific here about what we are to say when we pray. But uh, those people who, who uh, say, well, there is no posture of prayer given to us in Scripture, so you can do anything that you want to. You don't have to hold your hands. You don't have to bow your heads or close your eyes. Um, <laughs> while those things are true, there is, there is a posture of prayer given in Scripture. And uh, it, it, God is a very specific. It is not simply a suggestion. It is a commandment of how you are to hold your body and how are you, you are to hold your mind in prayer. Uh, these things are not just suggestions or advice by God. He is very specific, and it is a commandment, both in the Old and in the New Testament, to the extent that he refuses to hear a prayer that is not prayed according to his commandments. 
God set down the rules for prayer. And if you don't follow the prayer and you don't follow the rules of prayer, then God simply will refuse to hear your prayer. And you've got to wonder just how many prayers are being prayed to God that he doesn't hear compared with how many he does. But that's another sermon. Let's, uh, let's continue with uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 10. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. We love to love that last part. Uh, for Christ's sake, when I am weak, then I am strong, because it makes me strong. And that's a good thing. We like to be strong Christians. Um, we're not being encouraged to be jerks here. We've got to put all of these scriptures together to discover what it is that God is really telling us. And so when I am strong, I am strong in the Lord, and I am to rejoice for these kinds of things. Look at that list again. I take pleasure in infirmities. Infirmities, sicknesses like COVID. <laughs> I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities. Necessities are, are things that, from an evil point of view, are things that you must do, that are, that, that, uh, uh, are, are forced upon you, so to speak. In persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, not for your own sake and not for being a jerk about your Christianity or, or your faith or, or being offensive about your faith. Remember the, uh, the knight in shining armor of God approach. Um, we are to defend ourselves from the wiles of Satan and from the evil thrust upon us elsewhere in the world. Uh, we are to defend ourselves with the armor of God. We are not to defend God, because frankly, God, if God needs me to defend him, God's in a lot of trouble. First Peter 2, First Peter 2, verse 12. Having your conversation, now the word conversation in the, in the, the old English, the King James English here, uh, means behavior. Having your behavior honest among the Gentiles, um, uh, referring to the unbelieving or the unsaved, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may be, uh, they may by your good works which they may behold, they may see, they may discover, glorify God in the day of visitation. The, the, the day that they see these things happening, the, the day that they, they suddenly realize, you know what, you're a good guy. Uh, you, what you've been doing is, is good, and not just for Christians, but good in general. Now, this is a difficult thing because we are also told that we are to give and do uh, good works uh, uh, to those who are in need, um, both for giving purposes as well as for good deed purposes. We are to do these things for people who are in need, who are either poor or for one reason or other, needy at this particular moment. Even if those people have plenty of money, there are times when they will be needy, um, and we are to address those needs, not just uh, for the sake of the need, not just to alleviate difficulty and tribulation in the world, but in the name of Christ. This is, uh, uh, this is more than, than once given to us among the commandments of the New Testament. Uh, when we give, we are to give in the name of Jesus as unto Jesus, indeed, 
Uh, we are to, to do so so that we don't present ourselves as the giver, but they receive it as from the Lord. And furthermore, when we give, we are to give to the Lord, not to someone else. Um, Jesus went so far on the Sermon on the Mount as to say, when you give, give it in secret. Give it in secret. Now, we jump to the conclusion that we're not supposed to take glory uh, from other men for our giving. And that's true. But when it says do it in secret, it means more than that, doesn't it? It means that we're not supposed to do it so that anybody else, including the person receiving this gift of either deeds or money, understands that it came from us. Instead, they are to be given this gift so that glory is given to God, whether there's a, they're a Christian or not. They are to glorify God, and that's a tough one to do. That's a tough one to do, especially among unbelievers. But if, if you give deeds or money through an intermediary, uh, and I'll just mention this briefly, even though that's not part of this sermon, uh, you can do this by almost thinking, uh, thinking of this as an escrow account. Uh, there are plenty of good charitable organizations that have been set up specifically for this purpose. Uh, you give money to somebody like, uh, 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 what's the name, Sharon? The World Vision. Uh, World Vision is a good example. Uh, they they uh, go all over the world finding people who are in need, either uh, because of poverty or because of their situation, um, and they seek to, to do away or, or help with that need, not of their own resources, but of ours, someone else's. And they do it specifically in the name of Jesus. Now, this is fascinating because I can give money to World Vision. Uh, they are not the recipient of my gift. In fact, a very, very small portion of the gift is taken for the expenses incurred in doing the, the delivery, if you will, of that, that gift to someone else. I have no idea. I should have no idea. And I should seek to know nothing about the person or persons who ultimately will receive my gift. I am giving to World Vision as unto the Lord. I know that it's going someplace in the world. I know that it's going to be benefit, perhaps, people in this continent or in this city or in this uh, village in this continent like Africa. But I don't know those people, nor do I know the person who is going to benefit or persons that are going to benefit by my gift. I am giving as unto the Lord. And that's very important. This is a commandment given to us by Jesus. Furthermore, when it's received on the other end by these people in this village, in this continent, it is not to be given to them in my name. It's to be given to them in the name of Jesus. Whether they believe in Jesus as the Son of God or not, whether or not they are saved is not the point. World Vision will make sure that they understand that this gift was given to them by God. And that's their part. That's what they are there to do to make sure that everyone realizes that this gift is coming from God, not from Steve Carl or anybody else uh, in, in America or elsewhere. Um, and to the extent that I give anonymously and they receive anonymously, but both of us are focused on the Lord, we are giving according to the commandments about almsgiving and deeds, uh, alms uh, deeds uh, in, in the New Testament. Uh, let's turn finally to 1 Peter 3.16, one of the 3.16s in Scripture. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good behavior in Christ. Your good behavior... Uh, is uh, quite often uh, uh, twisted. Uh, and, and the way, I th thought about this a little bit, and uh, the way that people usually twist 
uh, the good deeds done and the, and the good giving that has, has been done uh, in Christ or, or uh, to the purposes of Christ, the way that this is usually twisted is not in the gift itself, but in the motivation behind the gift. Now, people will falsely accuse us of twisted uh, uh, motivations. They don't know our motivations, but they can assume from their perspective and perhaps from their own personal experience what the motives of doing this actually must be. And uh, so they will criticize you and Christ and the faith uh, for the good deeds, the good things that you are doing in the name of Jesus. Um, we are to uh, have uh, a good behavior, uh, it says, have a good conscience uh, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you your good behavior in Christ. And uh, that brings us to the end of the passages, uh, New Testament passages, regarding revi being reviled for our faith. Um, in all of this, however, uh, something is not mentioned. Although we are to rejoice uh, in being reviled for our faith, and we are to make sure that we're not being uh, uh, taking any rejoicing or, or joy in being reviled for being a jerk about Jesus or about anything else, we need to be sure that we don't approach people as offensive. We are not offensive for the name of Jesus. Uh, we are defensive, if anything, and more importantly, we are, are doing so in love. It's, it's really important for us, uh, uh, given the commandments that, are, uh, that have been given to us by God in the New Testament, um, it's really important for us as a contemporary Christian church that we love those and think more highly of others than ourselves. And, and this is given to us over and over again, of course, in the pages of the New Testament. Uh, God wants us to be meek and kind and generous and loving. And we are to do all of these things in the name of Jesus, but we are not to put on the armor of God so that we can slay evil or wickedness in the world. That's not our job. We're to protect ourselves with the word of God. And to the extent that people revile us or attack us, uh, we are to respond in kindness. We are to respond in good deeds. And we are to respond by, by doing things for our enemies. Um, there's a whole section in the commandments regarding how we are, our duty to our enemies, um, if you will. And uh, this is a huge thing. And, and unfortunately, there are many parts of the Christian church today that are are fighting uh, uh, the battle, so to speak, against uh, uh, non-Christians and, and to those who would attack the Christian faith. Uh, and they are no better than, than the Muslims that do the same thing. Um, we, we've got to be very, very careful that we look at all of Scripture and not just our favorite verses. Uh, we've got a little bit of time, so let's move, move to the next section. Um, this is a this is a different part of our biblical duty to mankind. Uh, God specifically tells us, uh, don't question or resist authority. Now, I, I'm old enough that, that uh, I was a, a teenager in, in high school and in college during the hippie generation. And, and uh, the uh, watchword among them uh, was, you question authority, all authority. Um, uh, this is not new to the hippies. Before them, there were the beatniks, and before them, they were the, they were the, uh, uh, I can't even remember what they called them back in the 20s. And and uh, but but uh, the point is that this has always been something there, uh, usually among the youth, um, usually among the rebellious. Uh, the establishment was wrong, and uh, therefore we question their authority over us. How many times does God say specifically in Scripture, you are to obey and honor your parents, your mother and your father? And those who do not do these things are not worthy of salvation. Now, God has been very specific about this. The establishment, if you are rebelling against 
uh, your parents or what they believe in or what they tell you, uh, uh, you, you have to be very, very careful, uh, especially if you, if you plan on eternity with God. God has said so much on the subject that uh, this should be uh, de facto. This should, we, we shouldn't have to review these things as though they were uh, commandments, but God does, so we will too. Let's turn to Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Romans chapter 13. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, you might jump. (laughs) It's it's almost natural for us to say, well, what do you mean by higher powers? Uh, Does that include the president? Does it include... Uh, uh, Congress? Uh, What about the Supreme Court? Uh, What exactly are higher powers? Uh, God doesn't draw a line here. He simply says higher powers. And by higher powers, you have to assume by what we are about to read that higher is anything higher than you. And that includes the traffic cop. Uh, the the government official at the DMV, uh, the higher powers are anybody that has power over you in any way, shape, or form. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Now, you can argue this all you want, but make sure that you read everything that God has had to say before you start reading and believing the, well, that doesn't apply to us, from the pulpit or from the commentaries or from any tape series or or video series that you might be listening to. Higher powers is not qualified in this verse, but it is elsewhere, and we'll get to that momentarily. Let every soul be subject, that is, subservient, subordinate to, obedient to, subject unto higher powers. For there is no power but of God. Boy, that's a powerful, potent statement. Uh, What about Satan? Doesn't Satan have power? There is no power but of God. Uh, Boy, that's a whole other series of sermons, but uh, we'll leave that for the time being. The powers that be are ordained of God. Even if you you reduce that to only the powers that are earthly, that is, uh, the men in power over you, uh, from the president on down. The powers that be are ordained of God. What do you mean? That, that uh, the current president, whoever he happens to be, that I don't agree with, and uh, what do you mean powers that be are ordained of God? You mean that that ungodly man that's sitting in the White House right now is there because God ordained him to be the president? What about my vote? Didn't it count? Verse 2, Whomsoever, therefore, resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive unto themselves damnation. Folks, you should be scared to death if you are resisting or questioning authority over you. Whether it comes in the form of the president or somebody sitting in the in the chair behind the counter at DMV. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God because God put them there. God put them in that place of power for his purposes, not for yours. Uh, there, There are people who will discount and dismiss what we're talking about here simply because they will not believe that a God of love could put that president that 
is sitting in the White House, right? There's no way that he is there because he's a good man. I didn't say he was a good man. I think that there are many times when a public official over us, a power set over us by God is there because we deserve him rather than because we need him. There are probably better qualified, as far as I'm concerned, individuals to be in power over me. Uh, but uh, that was God's choice, not mine. And he says so here in the pages of Scripture and elsewhere. Whosoever, therefore, resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, well, what about if I do something good and I get blamed for it, or I, I uh, am taken to task for it? Uh, what if I do something in the name of Jesus and I'm, uh, I'm persecuted for it? Well, we just read all of that. We're supposed to receive that with rejoicing because we did it in the name of Jesus. That doesn't mean that we won't be persecuted. It doesn't mean that we won't receive punishment and penalties and, and, uh, uh, and hardship and difficulties. It means that we are to receive it with rejoicing because we did it in the name of Jesus Christ. And if we are punished for it, so much the better. So much the better. Do that which is good, and thou shalt be, have praise of the same. Now, doing something that is good in the name of Jesus is one thing. But it doesn't mean that simply because it was in the name of Jesus that you're going to be praised by the ungodly of the world, especially those in authority, that were put there by God, whether they were Christians or not. Think about Paul, uh, the penman here, writing to the Roman people, the Roman church, at a time when the Roman Caesars were persecuting the Christians, as well as the Jews, uh, uh, and, and they, any, any Christian that they caught speaking the name of Jesus in a public place or, or uh, 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 setting up a pulpit and preaching salvation by Jesus, uh, these people could be arrested and thrown to the lions in the Colosseum. I mean, the, the, the horror of what happened uh, as a result of Christianity in the first three centuries after Jesus uh, is uh, chronicled in, in great detail in um, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. And uh, it's something that used to be on every Christian's bookshelf, but is... Uh, uh, is more or less uh, unknown and unread today. Um, it's still available, uh, Amazon.com. <laughs> um, but uh, for he, that is that person that has been placed in power over you, for he is the minister of God to thee for good, as far as God is concerned. Now, just because God thinks something is good doesn't mean that I will think it's good. Uh, if God decides to send rain on uh, a town, uh, that one end of that town, there's a farmer, he's going to say, oh, praise God, it's raining. At the other end of town, there may be a carpenter, and uh, he may be uh, uh, excruciating pain because it's raining and he's out of work. Um, he may be out of work for some time as a result of this rain. Uh, because he can't build, he can't do his job, he can't earn a living while it's wet. And uh, uh, what one perceives as good, the other one may perceive as evil. The question here, though, isn't what is good as far as I am concerned. From my point of view, it's what is good according to God's purpose and God's plan. And uh, I should be willing and ready to suffer for God's plan rather than my own. But if 
thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. He doesn't have his power in vain. The point that uh, God is making here is that uh, he has put these people in power, and they have power uh, over those that, that he's put them in power over. I, I don't know that sounds like it's redundant, but the point is he beareth not the sword in vain. Uh, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil, uh, according to God's view of good and evil, not yours, and, and not necessarily the law of the land, for that matter. God is in control, all things, all the time. Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Quorum Dio, you are in the presence of God doing these things. For this cause, pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Tribute means taxes, fines, fees. Uh, don't look for ways to evade paying taxes. You can avoid paying taxes that you don't owe, but if you owe tax, pay it. God commanded it. You, If you are short of cash, it makes no difference. God commanded that we do this. You know, there are people who will pay tithes to the church in error, there is no such thing as a commandment anywhere in the New Testament to pay a tithe to the church. It's one, once again, it's one of the horrible things that we have thrust upon uh, the, uh, the people of the church. The, God gave the tithe to the Jews in the Old Testament, and he was very, very specific about not only how much would be paid, how it would be paid, and who it would be paid to. It was specifically for the Jews. It was part of the covenant with God among the Jews and not among the Christians. It was given specifically to the Levites who were in service at the temple. It did not include the Levites that were not doing service at the temple. It was their paycheck. That was what the what it was for. It was not given. It was not given to the church. The tithe is mentioned several times in the New Testament, but only in reference to how it was done in the Old Testament. The tithe is never commanded in the New Testament to Christians nor the church. I know that this is a, a shock to a lot of people listening to this, uh, but that's another sermon, and I'm not going to get going go down that rabbit trail right now. But we've got a lot of mistakes that we've made in the Christian church today, and it's time that we started thinking about this in terms of Scripture, not just from what we've heard from from the the pulpit. Uh, there are way too many things that we have corrupted in the process of our own greed and our own necessity, so to speak. God is uh, is pretty specific about this. We are to pay our tribute, though. And those people who would avoid paying their taxes, but they will pay the the uh, the tithe to the church, are are in big trouble, and they don't even know it. They don't even know it. But let's leave that behind for the moment. Uh, for this cause, pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. The IRS is doing God's work. Think about that for a second. Render, therefore, to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. And honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. Now, keep in mind that just because you love one another doesn't mean that you have obeyed the commandments. Uh, what it means is that if you live your life in perfect love for all men, perfect love to all men, 
that you have fulfilled the law. But of course, nobody can do that. Nobody but Jesus. Owing no man anything means that if something is due, you must pay it. When you take out a loan to, to buy a house or a car or something like that, um, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, today, we, we have kind of the idea that we owe, uh, you know, $100,000 on this, this house that I live in. I still owe $100,000. That's not owed yet, not until the payment comes due. Um, if you have a $1,000 a month payment on your house, um, then when it comes due, you owe it. That's the way that this, this is presented in Scripture. You owe this. Don't go behind on your bills. That's what this is saying. If you owe something, pay it. Don't hold it back. Don't owe any man anything but to love one another. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, and so forth. There are lots and lots of commandments that are given here that are from the Old Testament that are, once again, being given to us here in the New Testament. And it's not just here in Romans. Um, uh, those of you who have been following this series for some time know that, that there are, are uh, uh, we are still working up the list of commandments from the New Testament. I am anyway, and, and uh, this is for my own sake as well as for, for my family and for those of you who are are following this series, but we're well into the 200s now, uh, commandments given to us in the New Testament. Uh, out and out commandments, no doubt about it. And, and uh, this is a short list right here of just the commandments that we are responsible for and that God will hold us accountable for. Notice that these commandments are all from the Old Testament. And yet they are being given to us here in the New Testament as commandments for the church. Uh, we all know that, that we're not supposed to commit adultery or kill or uh, steal, and, and you're not supposed to bear false witness or covet. And, uh, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If you did love your neighbor perfectly as yourself perfectly, then you wouldn't do these things. But knowing that they are laws of God for the church, as well as in the Old Testament, um, knowing that these are commandments that God has given to us as Christians in the New Testament, we should be obeying these rather than seeking to love all men perfectly. Because frankly, I can disobey these commandments even while I am loving men according to my own standards. I can think of all kinds of good things that I can do that violate the commandments of God. Because what I'm thinking of is are things that are good as far as I'm concerned, or good as far as my children are concerned, or good as far as my neighbor is concerned. But it's not good according to what God considers good. Let's turn to uh, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 2. First Timothy 2, 1 to 2. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire it. A good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, and apt to teach. The uh, uh, idea here is uh, uh, we are, are being given the requirements, so to speak, the, the uh, uh, prerequisites. Uh, for a man who is is uh, to receive the office of bishop in the church. Uh, uh, we might think of a bishop uh, in the church as the equivalent of a pastor in the church, although that, that office has changed somewhat uh, in church organization over the years. Uh, today, a bishop can be uh, 
a pastor of pastors, so to speak. And, and that's not the, the way that it was back here. Uh, uh, bishop, uh, bishopric, uh, uh, the office uh, that you hold as a bishop um, is, was the equivalent of a pastor back then. So a pastor must be blameless, the husband of one wife. And now I'm not going to argue at, at this point because it's a, a different sermon and requires a lot more work, uh, scriptural work uh, here to understand um, what this does and doesn't mean. Uh, but there, there is a lot of concern about whether this is the husband of one wife uh, in a lifetime or the husband of one wife at a time. Um, uh, but um, I think it's probably um, uh, just just a good idea to set this aside now and, and not deal with that question here. Um, we can do that uh, more fully uh, from Scripture and not just from, from my saying so one way or the other. Um, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, and apt to teach. These are all requirements of the bishop. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, First Timothy chapter two, <laughs> huh? I was in chapter three, but I'm supposed to be in chapter two, verses one and two. First Timothy chapter two, verses one and two. I exhort therefore. <laughs> Let me see. We got a little sermonette there, all on a different subject. Uh, chapter uh, 2, verses 1 and 2, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for all men, all men, all men, not just the ones that you agree with, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. We are supposed to be praying. We are supposed to uh, uh, give supplications, prayers, intercessions, and the giving of thanks for all men. Uh, that includes those in authority over us. Uh, kings, whether we agree with them or not, presidents, uh, and for all that are in authority, uh, including the guy at the DMV. Uh, these people are there by God's command. He's the one that put them there. He's the one that's given their, them their authority, regardless of how they use it. And by the way, if they abuse their authority, they will answer to God for it. You need to be careful that you don't have to answer to God for disobeying that authority. Um, you, might, you might just think to yourself, this is a test, and uh, God is seeing whether you will obey, um, regardless of the circumstances. Uh, finally, let's turn to 1 Peter 2.13. 1 Peter 2.13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man, for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood, that is Christianity, the faith. Fear God and honor the king or the president. We're supposed to be doing these things whether they, they are in agreement with me as to what's good and bad, God put them there, and we are to give them honor. We are to pray for them. We are to submit and obey them. We are not allowed to question their authority because their authority was given to them by God, and in questioning that authority, we are questioning God and receiving to ourselves damnation. I'm going to conclude uh, 
this morning there, and we will continue with the with uh, uh, passages res- uh, that relate to uh, questioning or resisting authority uh, next time we get together. And uh, so let's uh, uh, let's close in prayer. Lord, be with us all and bless us and have mercy on us. Forgive us, Lord, for our sins and lead us according to your purpose and your plan and not our own. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.